Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell, and as usual, my colleague, Clay Jones, is here with me tonight. Good evening, Good evening. Clay. Good evening. So, a lot of good things going on last couple yeah, of weeks. Yeah, but I think, uh, I think I want to start out talking about my new favorite allies in the struggle to change the drug laws. And that's the police. Okay. Uh, we can start out with an incident that happened in Arizona when a drug patrol agent was just casually discussing with other Border Patrol agents, the fact that the drug laws weren't working, that they weren't doing much good about it, and the Border Patrol fired him because he wasn't wholly dedicated to carrying out his job. This led to a long, thorough story in the New York Times discussing all of the ways this agent claimed the drug law wasn't working. I have never seen a drug law reformist get that kind of news coverage. Then last week here in Houston, the police unions all voted not to endorse District Attorney Pat Lycos in her reelection campaign. Last week, the Houston Chronicle ran a large story about this and showed that it was primarily the response of police to Lycos' decision over a year ago not to accept charges of felony drug possession against people that were arrested with just a little residue mm -hmm. in a pipe. Uh, made the police furious. As I say, this was a long story. The Chronicle explained Lycos' program and the reason for it in great detail. The fact that while this was happening, the crime rate in Houston actually went down a little bit. Uh, and then, yesterday in the Sunday paper, on the front page of the city section in the most prominent position, one of the featured political columnists wrote about this and really tore in the police and their attitudes and repeated once again the reasons for not prosecuting. Along with that, in the same paper, the lead editorial was saying the same thing and there was at least one letter to the editor on the same subject. So once again, I want to thank all of these police out there for helping us get the message into newspapers and into the airways in ways in which reformist alone we, couldn't do we it. We couldn't do it. Yeah, and I think along the same line, uh, you were discussing with me stories popping up all over California these days about uh, U.S. attorneys conducting raids on medical marijuana dispensaries, yes. sending letters, sending letters to landlords, uh, with o over 80 percent of the people nationwide in favor of medical marijuana. Once again, it seems to me that the drug warriors are just giving lots and lots and lots of otherwise unattainable publicity to the reform side. And if you look at history, I think the Obama administration is doing the same thing as the Hoover administration. That real big push right at the end of the 1920s to uh, enforce prohibition. Well, I think you're putting the blame in the wrong place. I think that this is happening at a much lower level than Obama. Um, you may not remember under George W's regime, when they ended up actually firing 
a lot of U.S. attorneys because they seem to be soft on electioneering crimes and things that were really political. Uh, there are, gosh, I don't know, a couple of hundred at least U.S. attorneys in the United States. Mm -hmm. And even though they are subject to some supervision by the Attorney General, they come as near to being independent fiefdoms on their own as you can find in a government agency. And most of them have been working hand in glove with the local DEA offices, prosecuting drug crimes their whole career. And I think as much as anything, what you're seeing with the overreactions of U.S. attorneys across the country is not the program of the presidential administration being carried into effect as independent resistance on the part of uh, U.S. attorneys, almost all of whom were appointed by George W. Bush, resisting the rather small, feeble efforts at change that Obama and Attorney General Holder have tried to initiate. Uh, one thing I think is important here is that in the now well over two years into the Obama administration, practically none of his U.S. attorney appointees or judicial appointees have been confirmed by the Senate. The Republicans in the Senate have just absolutely blocked almost any attempts to confirm any Obama appointments to the courts or to the U.S. Attorney's offices. So then, uh, what was it, George Bush um, Jr.? Yeah. Guy here? Yeah. Um, didn't he appoint some people that the Democrats didn't like when they were recessed? Well, now, a recess appointment uh, is a slightly different matter, and it works for things like ambassadorships and agency heads, but it doesn't, you can't use it for judges, and I'm not sure what the situation with U.S. attorneys would be. I thought George Bush had done, done that um, one time when the uh, Senate was on recess. Uh, if so, then that appointment then would expire when the Senate came back into session. It's, there's, there's not a good way around it. Uh, but I think that we're really seeing a power struggle within government on this issue. I don't get it because I, the more I've thought about mm -hmm. what you've been saying uh, last week when the drug war is going to end, yeah. November 6th, 2012. Yeah. It'll be over. And remember, this is a call-in program. We're always uh, looking forward to having your questions and giving you the best answer we can. Yeah. Uh, you can call us if you're watching live at the phone number on the screen. If you're watching through YouTube or a streaming video, you may make your questions or comments to the email address shown, and I will answer you back very quickly, and we may use your question or comment on the next program. But it's your show, and uh, we like your guidance to see where we need to go on this. Um, so. And California, they're really cleaning house out there. Uh, dispensaries are shutting down. Uh, 139 of them in San Diego. But I don't see that. You were mentioning it a little while ago, that it's really not going to put a hurting on the movement itself. Well, I, th I think one thing that, that's important to point out here is that we've seen a bit of a gold rush phenomena in California, less so in Colorado. But in California, 
everyone with an acre plot and 10 or 12 plants has opened a dispensary. There are a lot of people that have opened them up seeing a, a quick way to get rich. I think the market's been overbuilt and there's some rationalization going on. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Hey, uh, great show. Um, love you guys. I'm glad you're there. I'm glad that uh, Houston Media Source supplies the airtime. Uh, thank God for that, or wh whoever you want to thank. <laughs> um, I really feel deep down inside that uh, it, it does come from Obama, uh, that it comes from those powers that be, because you're seeing these, you know, these enforcement rules and regulations not only go into California, but you're seeing it in Colorado, which has the most liberal marijuana policies mm -hmm. in the country. But, you know, <coughs> New York City, of course, is one of the most flagrant um, people who take you in for any reason, but they're cutting back. Okay. My question is, how do we, as citizens, get these powers that be, how do we get them to the powers that be to realize that it's just insane to continue this anymore? We, we cannot sustain this kind of, quote, drug war anymore. Financially, okay. uh, sociologically, we can't do it anymore. Okay, I think we've got most of your idea. Let's talk about it some. Uh, I've been thinking that as I mentioned earlier, overreaction on the part of the police is helping us out. Because frankly, I, I follow the newspapers briefly on drug stories across the country. And I would say that in general across the country, there is much wider coverage of stories that are not just scare stories or DEA press releases than I have ever seen. We have watched the dominoes fall as more and more states have passed state medical marijuana laws. It looks like Washington will probably have a referendum on legalizing marijuana as far as the state's concerned this year. Uh, I believe they also said that once Washington states, the way their state works, is once they get the, um, the initiative certified, yeah. uh, it has to go through their state legislation before it's voted on by the uh, It citizens. doesn't have to go through, but the legislature has to have a chance to, yes. to enact a statute doing the same thing before the election date. Right, because then it takes three quarters of the uh, vote yeah. to change it. Yeah, but uh, that's, that's part of it, but it's just the overwhelming mass of, of opinion and, pre and news bubbling up. And I was thinking something else, and part of it comes from watching the 99% across the country. Enough people making enough noise gets attention. And somewhere within the last month or so, a city council somewhere in the United States discussed, and I don't think they voted on, but discussed adopting a city council resolution by which the city council would ask the state legislature and Congress to legalize marijuana. Now, the beautiful thing about it is it doesn't matter if that city passes that resolution or not. Anybody in any town in the country, from Idaloo, Texas to New York City, 
can present a proposal to their city council asking the city council to adopt a resolution asking the state legislature to change the marijuana laws. And if you follow your local procedures that you'd have to look up, the city council will have to put it on an agenda and open it up for discussion. And in Houston, at least, once a week when the city council meets, there's an open mic session where anybody can go and talk for three minutes. If enough people make enough city councils around the country talk about this, the word's going to spread and the ideas will bubble up. We're going to take a break and see you back in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, I think that I'm ready to do the nightly book review, and then we'll turn it over to Clayton to show us some things at the Drug Policy Alliance Convention recently in California. I'm going to start tonight's review by reading the epigram that introduces the book. The more prohibitions you have, the less virtuous people will be. Try to make people moral, and you lay the groundwork for vice. That's a quotation from the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, and it was the epigram that introduces Martin Togoff's Can't Find My Way Home, America in the Great Stoned Age, 1945 to 2000. This book's a little older than most of the ones I've talked about. Uh, it came out in 2004, but I just found out about it uh, last month, and frankly, it's been an intriguing read for me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, what Martin does is take this roughly half century. He starts out with the bop musicians and Charlie Parker progresses through the beats into the age of LSD, uh, marijuana and the hippie movements into amphetamines, and then back to heroin, then cocaine, 
uh, follows each of these episodes, introduces brief stories of people most of us know or know about that relate to it, and then with interview type short stories, tells the story of what's happening through short biographies of people that were involved in it. It's been a fascinating reason. I've got to confess that uh, looking at my ancient age uh, and the time that I came of age in the 50s and 60s, uh, it, it really hit home to me with the discussion of uh, the bebop cats like Charlie Parker and Mingus and Dizzy and the beatniks like Kerouac and Ginsburg. I'm sure that most of you would identify with some of the later people he talks about, like Snoop Doggy Dog, David Crosby. But it's a fascinating read, as well as being very informative. So if you get a chance, take a look at I Can't Find My Way Home. Now, the a little more serious subject, uh, Clay, you just returned from a major safari into the wilds of California. Yes, I went to the uh, Drug Policy Alliance uh, Conference. Okay. We have it. At, it's done every two years. It's yes. done in a different city. I believe last time it was in Albuquerque. Albuquerque, yeah. and the time before that was uh, New Orleans, and the time before that was Long Beach. Okay. Um, and I've watched this thing grow. I first one I went to was out in Long Beach. And I don't think there was but uh, maybe 800 people there. Um, this one, we had uh, damn near 1,400 people that uh, attended. Okay, well, what happens here? Is it just... Well, they, they bring in speakers from all over the world, and you can get caught up on what's going on uh, all over and what different um, things people are working on, different organizations, where they're doing a big push for the, uh, our, the marijuana movement. Uh, it's not just marijuana, though, is it? Oh, no, it's no, no. Uh, full drugs. I mean, yeah. I was, uh, I talked to a lady out there. She was from Portugal. Yeah. And she didn't realize that Portugal is held up as an example to the rest of the world. Yeah. She just, she didn't know that uh, there was this much attention being paid to what's going on over there. Yeah. Well, I think... Uh, that Steve's got some clips that you made while you were out yep. there. Uh, so if he's ready, we might uh, look at some of those, and after we see him, you can talk about what was going on. So, Steve, if you're ready, let's roll the videotape, as they used to say. McCoy, I'm from Hamilton, Montana. I'm with the Montana Cannabis Industry Association. And uh, we came here, down here to L.A., to the Drug Council Alliance meeting to basically bring awareness to our situation in Montana. Um, we feel it's a stopping ground for the federal government. And if we don't, uh, if we don't stop what's happening and bring awareness, then we feel that the rest of the states are going to uh, basically be dealt with just the way we were. Now, um, now you've come to the conference down here in uh, Los Angeles. We form uh, conference. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you uh, reception with what you're doing up in uh, Montana? Um, people are excited. They're glad to see how we're organizing things. Um, we've been basically bringing up new ideas and inventive ideas to bring money from local uh, chapters versus national national coverage like ASA and place, places like that. We're basically showing them how people should be able to do it on a local level, gain the money they need to start fighting their own their own fights. Um, and if National wants to come in and help out with that, that's, that's great, but you can't depend upon a white horse to be able to take care of you. You've got to do it yourself. Now, didn't you have a little bit of problems up there a short while ago that they were shutting down your uh, dispensaries and your the grows for those dispensaries? Uh, yes, basically what happened, uh, we had 26 federal raids during our, our last legislative session. Um, it was no more than, than 10 minutes after they decided not to have a repeal bill go through. They voted it out uh, that the federal government had come in and raided 26 uh, caregivers across our state. Uh, this was organized. 
Um, you even have people in legislation stating, hey, we all, this ought to be really good news in the paper this today or tomorrow. Um, so they're kind of joking about what was happening during the time period when it was happening. So it was really hard to understand on how they knew when nobody else knew. Um, uh, and then they end up coming up with a regulatory bill, what they claim to be regulatory. It's a repeal in disguise. It's called Senate Bill 423. It basically stated that uh, if you're a caregiver, you have to submit your fingerprints to the federal, federal government for background checks on misdemeanors, uh, misdemeanor possession charges, or any sort of felony charges. If you have any of these, you cannot be a caregiver. Uh, if you're a felon, you cannot have your, your medical marijuana card in the state of Montana now. Uh, they took the rights away from the felons, which is absolutely unjust. There was no reason you served your time. You should be able to take the medication that's best for your body. Uh, so basically what we had to do, we had to start Initiative Referendum 124. And the people spoke. That we've got the, the bill back onto the ballot so people can vote yes or no on that bill. Um, the legislators didn't have the right to be able to do what they did. And that's voter, uh, a voter's initiative, put the new laws in, and vote it through. Um, we feel that it was unjust to the to the general population, especially when we passed this bill in at 62 percent, which was the highest passed voters initiative ever in the state of Montana. Now, what are they doing with the people that they uh, raided? Are they prosecuting them? Yes, there has been several indictments. I believe 12 up to right now, and there's several more to be coming down the pipeline. And what does the uh, general populace feel about what the feds are doing? Montana doesn't like the federal government. Um, we believe that we should be able to regulate ourselves. We believe that um, we shouldn't have to have interference in the federal government. Um, so most people are pretty upset over, over allowing the, the federal government to come into the state of Montana. Um, we have what's called a right to privacy. The federal government can't supersede what's happening inside of our borders unless they're invited in. And then a judge signed a warrant to invite them in. What do you think about jury nullifications? Are you thinking those are possible in Montana? When with these indictments and when they start going to jail? Um, or going to court, not to jail? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, um, I think if they're allowing them to actually hear the state laws, you know, because the federal government's been known to just cancel any sort of state laws and basically state that they're selling marijuana, they're selling an illegal drug. Um, if anybody in the state of Montana understands what's happening, um, I would say that they would most likely be nullified, yeah. I, most of our jurors are pretty much down to earth people. So, we're, we're going to be winning the war through the court system. If I they can't hope. get a conviction, they can't arrest people. Either. Correct. Correct. I would hope so. I would hope so. I hope that people open up and open their eyes and realize what's happening. And I think that's a an aim that we all ought to start talking about is jury nullifications or fully informed jury association. Yep, yep, yep. We, uh, we have started um, similar uh, measures in Montana um, with ballot issues and whatnot, making sure that this type of stuff is going to happen. We've actually started another one uh, via Nathan Pierce with the Montana Rights Coalition, and uh, he's getting a congressional, oh, I want to say a referendum, but I think that's wrong. A con congressional initiative, basically stating that uh, what happened in our last legislative session, the legislators will not ever be able to do that again. Uh, if the voters initiative is passed through, the legislators can mingle with it, but then it has to come back to the next voters session to be able for the voters to be able to vote yes or no on what the legislators mingled on. Now, my understanding was that the your legislators had have a three quarter, uh, seventy five percent uh, against in order to actually repeal it. Yes. Yes, they have to have majority, and uh, and they didn't have the majority to repeal it. It was close. Um, yeah, so, so you pretty much feel that the populace is on your side, and it's more um, law enforcement and legislation that's uh, kind of against you. You know, I honestly feel that a lot of our law enforcement, um, they're kind of stuck in the middle. I've spoken to a lot of local police department people, and. Uh, and they really feel that they're kind of stuck in the middle. They don't really want to interfere too much. Some do. You know, some want to just stick to whatever they feel is the right letter of the law. Uh, but in these confusing times and changing of laws, a lot of our, a lot of the police department has just basically backed off, try to find the people that are fully outright breaking the law and sticking to those areas for right now, um, which is nice, which is nice that we don't have uh, the police presence as, as you would tend to think from, from what the legislators have been doing. Now, um Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with uh, letting us know in the Texas area? 
Um, I would definitely say don't give up your fight. I would say um, that through truth and through time, things will come out and they will understand the truth. I think education is the key. I think that having people properly represent this industry is the way to do it. Um, and I, and I honestly feel that the people that are emotionally attached to this have got to put their emotions aside and think about this logically and deal with it properly. Well, thank you. I, uh, would you tell us your name again and where are you from? My name is Robert McCoy. I'm from Hamilton, Montana, and I'm with the Montana Cannabis Industry Association. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, so... Uh Montana is very much involved. Um, he was saying that if people are brought to um, court, he really doesn't th don't think they're going to get uh, the convictions that they want. Well, you know that's Montana, Colorado, and California. All three present. Uh, the U.S. Attorney with an interesting problem. Now, under federal law, the court can absolutely bar any evidence about or mention of medical marijuana or state-approved marijuana in the courtroom during the course of the trial because that's irrelevant to the federal law. In the federal law, if you transferred marijuana to someone for any reason whatsoever, for free or for money, that's a delivery and it's a violation of the federal law. And even going back to Ed Rosenthal's conviction many years ago, mm -hmm. that's what happened there the judge knew what was going on and sentenced him to a day. But with what's happened in Montana, Colorado, and California, I'm not sure that a U.S. attorney, no matter how hard they work at it, can find a jury of 12 people in the state where none of the 12 knows anything about the state medical marijuana laws. And if they get just one person on the jury who is aware of and at all sympathetic to the state's medical marijuana law and that person sits there and refuses to vote guilty, they cannot get a conviction. And that, I think, is the dilemma that the U.S. attorneys are facing. Yes. Do they dare take a case to the jury? Because they can't, they can't get a virgin jury in those states. Um, how do I say this? Uh, there's, I think he said, 12 people that are already indicted yeah. in Montana. Yeah. If they can't get a jury or feel that it's going to be difficult to get a jury to convict them, how long can they stay indicted? Well, not that long. The federal government, like most states, has a speedy trial act. And once an indictment has been returned and the defendant has entered a not guilty plea, then the clock starts running and the government has to announce ready for trial within a fairly short period of time, a couple of months, are the cases dismissed. Hmm. So there's, there's no way that the government can stall the case once that indictment's been returned. Now the defense can drag it out as long as they want mm -hmm. to. But you know, if I were a U.S. attorney in one of those three states in particular, I'm not sure that I would be willing to take a case to a jury if it involved medical marijuana. 
I think they have trouble in more states than just those three. Well, those Rhode Island, Maine. Even in Rhode Island and Maine, there hasn't been the same amount of publicity. No, there hasn't. The same amount of controversy. You can probably find 12 lawyers from the backwoods of Maine who've never heard of marijuana or possibly even the federal government. <laughs> I don't think you can say that about California today. No. Incidentally, uh, just to throw out a random fact, uh, do you know what Maine is famous for in terms of drug laws? No. Maine enacted the first alcohol prohibition law in the United States. It outlawed the sale of alcohol in 1840. In fact, Maine is where the term bootlegger came from, from guys that would carry a flat pint bottle under their pants leg and sell single swigs of whiskey to guys in the street. But if you've ever looked at a map of Maine, it's got one of the longest, most rugged coastlines in the United States. Yes. And it sits right next to Canada, which was the major source of liquor during National Prohibition, is one of the main sources of marijuana today. And my goodness, the booze just flowed from Canada down into Maine, and that law was repealed before 1850. <laughs> So, you know, these laws do go away. Mm -hmm. And from what I know of Maine, I grew up in New England. Okay. I lived in Maine as a small child. Yeah. And Maine people just don't like to be told what to do. No, they're, they're a pretty independent, individualistic bunch. Uh, we used to drive up there for weekends from, from college. And it's a great place. But... Uh, did you get the sense at this association meeting that uh, this guy's attitude was fairly widespread? That yes, we're there and it's going to yes. happen. Uh, everybody at the conference was saying that it's ending. It's ending, yeah. so. and it's um, it's just the the consensus that there so many things are coming. Uh, to a yeah. point throughout the country, throughout the uh, world. Well, yeah, I think throughout the world means a lot here. We have another phone call. Uh, hello, caller, you're on the air. Hi, I've got a question about what would happen here in Houston if, like, I went to a concert, got busted with a couple of joints, went to jail. Could I get a court-appointed attorney and go to jury? Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> That's more your realm. That's more my realm. Uh, you can always plead not guilty and go to a jury trial. I believe, and I'm not sure on this, it's been so long since I did any kind of trial work. I believe that if there is a possibility of jail time involved, you're entitled to an appointed lawyer even if it's just a misdemeanor. The problem is, and here's where I'm in conflicted roles as a reformer and as someone who still thinks like a lawyer. The problem is right now, in Harris County, like in most places, if you get convicted or if you get charged with possessing a personal amount of marijuana, you set a couple of joints. And if you agree to plead guilty, they will arrange for you to have some sort of non-custodial sentence, probably probation with a fine, maybe some community service. If you plead not guilty and go to a jury trial, 
there is a chance you'll be convicted and a chance that you might spend six months or even longer in the county jail. So most of the time, most people don't feel like it's worth the risk of going to trial. If you're going to go to jury for a couple of um, yeah. joints, they are going to threaten you with the maximum yeah. punishment possible. Yeah. We get our conviction, we're going to do this. But if you'll sign here, and yeah. we'll make the penalty real easy and yeah. no court time. <laughs> but speaking out of the other side of my head, as a reformer, if 10% mm -hmm. of the people in Harris County charged with misdemeanor possession of marijuana insisted on going to jury trial, it would tie the police force, the district attorney's office, and all of the misdemeanor courts up into such a knot that they would never get it straightened out and the whole system would collapse from its own weight. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to take another break. We'll see more from uh, the Drug Policy Alliance meeting and be back in just a little bit. I am president of Ohio Patient Network and uh, medical marijuana director with Ohio Normal and uh, president of Miami Valley Normal, a little subchapter mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Will Huber actually wanted to do and a group of us got together and said, you know what, we'll make it happen. So uh, mm -hmm. we're growing leaps and bounds. Uh, Ohio is uh, in an exciting place for 2012. Uh, we have um, got two different uh, political action committees that have formed and submitted language uh, to bring the medical cannabis issue to the people, to the voters. And um, are you people doing anything as far as a referendum, non-binding referendum, binding referendum? What's going on Politically, that's, that's just what I was just getting ready to finish saying. Don't Good. Uh, the ballot is exactly that. What that's going to do is we have to gather uh, 385,285 uh, ballot registered voting signatures. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be a process that's going to begin very shortly. Uh, we have until July of uh, 212, and we're real excited about having the possibility to put this before the people, because 73% of Ohioans support the medical use. So then it should be fairly easy to get those signatures that you want. Oh yeah, uh, any um, thing that would have the word marijuana or cannabis on it, to be honest with you, uh, would be passed by the voters of Ohio because they know that that plant shouldn't even be uh, outlawed. They really do. And they know that at least, at the very least, it should be allowed to folks that are suffering mm -hmm. and under a doctor's care. Mm -hmm. Then we have Ohio uh, Medical uh, Cannabis Act of 2012 that is going at it by a civil rights issue. You know, it really is a civil rights issue. Um, it's everyone's civil right to uh, liberty and life, uh, happiness. And not to be searched? Oh yes, that's, that's true. Uh, this prohibition is just horrible. Uh, and the only thing that is harmed, or the reason only it, everyone is harmed by marijuana or cannabis or pot, whatever, whatever you want to call it, uh, is because of the prohibition. It's not because of that plan. Um, you know, this Drug Policy Alliance conference that we're at right now is just so amazing. Such powerful folks. The networking that goes on here is wonderful. I mean, uh, people, I mean, I've seen Professor Bill Martin here. 
Russ Jones. I've seen uh, so many big, important people that make themselves accessible to everyone. You know, um, I, I want to say hello to Texas because uh, Texas has uh, got a lot of wonderful activists down there, very uh, dedicated, passionate folks. And keep your heads up. You know, if I could give you any advice in the world is try changing one person's mind at a time. You don't have to go for the mass. You can just do it one person at a time. And if you can change somebody's hell no to a maybe, that is a good thing. Um, you know, I really need every state to stand up for me right now. Very quickly, in August, I was hospitalized and my blood pressure was all over the place. And they admitted me. They did a CAT scan, and they came in 24 hours later and said, Tanya, there's nothing we can do for you anymore. All we can do is treat your symptoms and make, keep you comfortable. So, okay, so, you know, it's like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? So, what they told me was, when well, they did this CAT scan, This is massive calcium deposits that's covering my brain. It's like a mask. It's, your brain controls everything. So, you know, I had to start thinking about, okay, Tanya, your time might be running out. That's okay. I can live with that, guys. I really can. Don't get all upset. But I got to thinking. You know, maybe God put me in this position to push our current president into showing some uh, compassion, uh, somewhat of being a human, you know? Because uh, I know at this point a lot of you activists are feeling disgruntled and lied to. I'm with you on that. But I believe President Obama should reopen the investigational new drug program. If medically they can't help me, that'd be cool. But medically they can help me. And with the help of our President Obama, I believe that this can happen. All he'd have to do is just reopen the investigational drug program it would still be under government control. Um, he wouldn't be legalizing or decriminalizing. He would be giving us a crop. You know, he would be showing some compassion. So I'm down here trying to talk these uh, experts into doing this. So keep your heads up, folks. Um, I'm out here fighting for you. And the uh, Texas activists that I know, here is a shout out to you. Okay, much love. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. And we have our friend Dean Becker from the Drug Truth Network on the phone. How are you tonight, Dean? I'm doing well, doing well. I, uh, I think there's just been some really powerful news, a uh, lot of... Uh, um, information flowing forth, uh, columnists writing uh, astounding, uh, you know, op-eds, and, and just yeah. people in general are starting to get on the bandwagon. We're starting to realize it's time to end this drug war. Yeah. I agree with you there. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think the, uh, I don't know, the, the situation involving uh, politicians being afraid of that third rail, I think some of them are going up and at least throwing rocks at it or something these days, trying to see how big the spark is. Reaching out with a very, very long stick and poking gingerly. <laughs> exactly right. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's going on. And it, it really involves uh, folks like you that uh, put forward this information that help allay the fears of people 
and let, that let them know it's all right to talk about it. And I think most importantly, as you always do at the end of the show, important to call your and visit and write your congressman, your elected officials. Let them know that you know the truth and that it's okay, right? I think that that's extremely important, that you've got to let your elected politicians know that you're the boss, you've got instructions for them, and it's time for them to toe the line or get fired. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. Uh, I, I don't know if you had a chance to catch my uh, shows yesterday, but I had a couple of great guests on uh, uh, Glenn, excuse me, Glenn Greenwald. Uh, he writes for Salon Magazine and Alternet and a lot of other yes, places. He's yes. been uh, written about in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall yeah. Street Journal, and who knows what all. Um, and, and he's done a lot of in-depth investigation of this drug war. Uh, one of the major reports he did was about the situation in Portugal. Now, 10, perhaps 11 years that they've decriminalized drugs yes. there. And they've seen the uh, rate of uh, youth, uh, use by the youth. That's hard to say. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, uh, plummet. They've <coughs> seen uh, fewer people addicted. They've had more and more people seeking treatment. Um, I, I think fewer overdose deaths, less hepatitis and, and AIDS. And, and uh, in general, reap the benefit of... Uh, not enforcing this like the United States does. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I have wondered, Dean, uh, in Portugal, what has happened to their costs of drug law management since they have switched from uh, an imprisonment to a treatment mode? You know, <clears throat> I, I don't know any specific facts there. I do know this, that uh, you could extrapolate uh, a similar situation here just for marijuana, say. Yeah. You know, the thousands upon thousands of arrests here in, in Houston each year, uh, taking police away from more important uh, crime solving, yeah. if you will, uh, crowding up our jails, costing the taxpayers money. Uh, we all know that doesn't benefit the community yeah. in any fashion to lock those people up. But the, there are tens of thousands, if not 100,000 man hours just right there each year. Yeah. Uh, multiply that times, say, uh, 20 or 30 bucks an hour for each police officer, and you're, you're up there in uh, some high uh, numbers of millions yeah. that, that uh, just get squandered. And that's, that's just for, again, very conservative amount, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure it's a lot more than that. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the point being, you know, they, they send the, their arrestees or their, I don't think they arrest them, they, they give them a ticket and a command to visit a medical clinic yeah. where a couple of people sit down with them and evaluate whatever their drug problem might be. Yeah. And then they, uh, you know, make recommendations. If they're not uh, out whoring themselves <laughs> or whatever, uh, just dabbling in it, well, they leave them alone. You know? yeah. No one gets arrested, uh, goes to jail, nobody uh, uh, gets a record, yeah. and uh, life goes on. One of the things that uh, has been a big improvement in Portugal was that their crime rate went way down. Yeah. People no longer had to be breaking into houses, robbing, stealing, in order to satisfy their habits. Well, it's, it's uh, uh, another guest I had on, on my show yesterday. He's written a great book. It's called uh, uh, Drug, excuse me, World War D. The Case Against Prohibitionism, A Roadmap to Controlled Relegalization. The author was uh, Jeffrey Dywood. Uh, he, he was on uh, for the bulk of the show. And uh, he's, he's framed this up. He gives you a good bit of history, uh, lets you realize where these drug laws came from, which was basically some grand fabrication. Uh, it, it educates you on these problems and some of the solutions, like what goes on in Portugal and so forth and uh, make some great recommendations, drawing from uh, reports and studies that have been conducted uh, from around the world, as well as uh, some very good ideas of his own on how to be pragmatic, how to face yeah. down this lion and not suffer uh, much injury at all. Yeah. Well, uh, you might remind viewers where your shows are and where you can be found. And Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I, I would invite folks to tune in on Sunday evenings. Uh, every Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. 
Uh, you can listen at kpft.org. And uh, there are now geez, seven, eight hundred of my shows of these half hour programs uh, uh, online at um, the website, which I hope is on screen there. Uh, drugtruth.net. Yes, it's there. Uh, featuring the words of doctors, scientists, uh, I don't know, physicians, priests, providers, any and everybody dealing with the subject of drug war. Even have a few interviews there with Pat Lykos, our current DA. Uh, um, had a short interview with uh, UN drug czar and uh, a lot of folks that uh, I, I think whose opinions you'd respect. You know, frankly. I, I appreciate you, you guys' work. Frankly, your list of interviewees impresses the hell out of me, Dean. Well, and I hope we hear from you two weeks from tonight. So thank you. You, you betcha. And uh, the clock's starting to run down. If I've got time, I would like to ask for your help. Uh, you can send me the information at the email address on the screen. I'm interested in collecting information about the history of drug use in Houston in the early days. I know there was a heroin maintenance clinic that operated here in 1919. I know that when William Burroughs had his marijuana farm in New Caney in 1948, he meant to sell the crop to the Houston dock workers. I know that in the 20s and 30s, uh, Houston was on the big blues and jazz circuit from Chicago to Kansas City to Los Angeles. Uh, so if any of you can direct me to sources where I can find out more about this, or if you have stories from your friends and families, there may even be a few oldsters around that remember the music scene here in the 40s. Uh, Please let me know what uh, you've got and where I can go to find out information, to find out the history of our own little city. I bet it will turn out to be more fascinating and more rich than most of us imagine. And if you're not emailing me that kind of information, Dean and Clayton and I, all three, urge you to write, call, visit your representatives, your senators, your state legislators, even if you think he can understand the English language, your governor, and let them know what you think about this country's insane drug laws. Care to add anything to that? Yes, uh, we have an election next year we all should start getting primed up for it, calling all our representatives that are going to be representing us uh, through that, after that uh, election. And you need to tell them that uh, this drug war needs to end and you want them to back the ending of it. Okay. And uh, we're running the clock down so we will expect to see you at the same time and place two weeks from tonight and I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs>